Last thing I wanted to talk about today was the difference between diastereomers and enantiomers in terms of labeled asymmetric carbons. So say we had a molecule with three asymmetric carbons in it. And say it was the it was an RRR molecule. That just means that we have the same configuration at all three um, stereo centers. An RRR molecule is the enantiomer of an SSS molecule with the same connectivity. So what that means is that to obtain the enantiomer of this molecule, what we need to do is invert the configuration or exchange two of the substituents. Usually we think about exchanging the substituents on the wedge and the dash just because leaving the zigzag in-plane bonds the same is, tends to be more convenient. Exchanging those three substituents will lead us to the enantiomer. So when we do that, placing the OH back, the middle OH back, and this OH out now, we've now obtained the enantiomer of the original compound. And if you imagine rotating this sort of around this way, and then placing a mirror between the two, you would be able to see that they are indeed mirror images. And I would invite you to see if you can superimpose these two molecules. And I would suggest tentatively that it is not possible. So these are non-superimposable mirror images. And really the key take-home message is that at all of the stereo centers on these two molecules, the configuration differs. So RRR, SSS is the enantiomer. Um, RSR, SRS would be the enantiomer. The configuration is opposite at every stereo center in the two molecules. That's how you know they're enantiomers based on their RS designations. Oh, and that should say enantiomers rather than diastereomers. Diastereomers, on the other hand, and I accidentally deleted this slide, I apologize for that, but diastereomers have different but not opposite configurations. So imagine we had a molecule that was R, S, R, for instance. Um, let, me, let me think of a different example here. So say we had a, a benzene ring with a substituent here, and another one with a substituent here. and yet another one with the substituent here. So here's an RSR molecule for you. If we inverted the configuration at only one or two, but not all three of the stereo, iso uh, stereo centers, which are right here, then we would end up with a diastereomer. So for instance, if I took that guy and changed only one of the configurations, those two molecules are related as diastereomers. And to see this, just recall our definition of what a diastereomer actually was. Diastereomer is just a, a set of molecules. Two diastereomers are just a pair of molecules with different internal dimensions but the same connectivity. So of course, the connectivity here is all the same. All we did was interchange the methyl group and the hydrogen on that top carbon there. But the internal distances are different. So the distance between, for instance, this methyl group and this one is substantially different from the distance between the methyl group and that same one corresponding in the diastereomer. So we see those two are diastereomers. So the take-home message there is that diastereomers have different but not completely opposite configurations. So for instance, more examples of diastereomers just in terms of RS labeling would be 
RS is a diastereomer of RR. Um, SSS is a diastereomer of RSS and the various combinations thereof. And you can think of countless examples of this, um, sort of bringing things full circle and going back to the very first example, those two molecules were diastereomers of each other, the two diols. So the one diol has R configuration here, and here it has S configuration. The other diol had RR configuration. Oh, excuse me. This should be R. This diol has RS configuration. Actually, nope. You know what? I was right the first time. Apologize. RS configuration. This diol has RR configuration. And so these are diastereomers of each other, just like we concluded way back when we first talked about the definition of diastereomer. So hopefully after this discussion, you've gained an appreciation for how you can use the labels to figure out whether two molecules are enantiomers or diastereomers. And I'll say, I've said it before, I'll say it again, but keep in mind that enantiomerism and diastereomerism are relationships between molecules. So you can't say one molecule is an enantiomer just based on its configuration. You have to compare that configuration to another one, and then you can say whether those two molecules are enantiomers or diastereomers of each other. All right, so next time we're going to talk about the energetics of stereoisomers and the implications this has on reactivity and separation of enantiomers and diastereomers. So some questions to think about. When is one stereoisomer more or less stable than another? Why are enantiomers equal in energy? What consequences does it have, this have on reactivity, and how do we separate enantiomers? So we're going to hit these questions next time, but uh, thanks for joining us today, and I'll see you next time.